I don't want to say that my wife inspired me to put that video on, but there was one look, there was three girls, and there was one look, it kind of looked like this. That was, it reminded me of something I've seen at home once or twice, so I don't know, but uh, when she kept going back for the bat, that was incredible, but, but all, uh, all sincerity, um, I just want to say happy Mother's Day to moms. I, I don't, I don't understand how, well, I don't understand how women are made anyway, I just, you know, that whole thing, but I don't understand how you can be a mom. Like, when, my, when Meredith leaves me alone with, there's just like the two kids for an hour, like, heaven forbid she come to a Bible study at this church, and I'm like texting her, are you guys done? Are you guys done? Like, I, I don't even understand. I just want to go jump off a building in like 45 minutes, and I don't, I don't know how you do it. I, 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 don't, I don't, but God bless you. Um, so just, I think we should just acknowledge moms one more time. If you're a mom, awesome. Good work, good work. Um, I, I guess tomorrow is, is, is Mother's Day, right? So uh, we're gonna celebrate. I'm gonna let my wife cook me dinner. And I'm just kidding. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna cook dinner for her. Actually, I'm gonna have Blair cook the dinner. I'm just gonna enjoy that steak. That's gonna be good. Thank you, mommy. Uh, anyway, well, uh, I'm so happy to be here and, and just really blessed to, uh, to have the Father's House here with us. You know, one of the, I, you guys know if you go to this church, one of the things that's like down deep in my heart is, is the unity of the body of Christ and churches coming together and it's not my way and it's my people and stealing folks and I'm right and you're wrong and we go to heaven, you're not going to be there, I will be and all that stupid stuff and Christians fight about things that don't matter and I don't know there's just a growing sense in our community here we experience it in Eustis we're experiencing it here in Leesburg as well where where just the church of Jesus Christ is coming together and they're just working as one unit to bring the gospel to the city and and so it's it just awesome that you guys would even come and do this you know what I mean like uh, a lot of churches just don't do that and, and there's fear, like, uh, they're really good singers, so we're going to go there from now on. And, you know, here's the thing. If you want to go there, you can. Like, it's okay, right? Because their church, I'm going to, I, can you uh, turn down the subwoofer, just that slider, just a little bit? Thank, oh, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, I don't even know what I'm saying, but, but, but we're one church, you know? We're one church. And, and Jesus Christ is the, I'm not the pastor here, Jesus is. Terry's not the pastor, Jesus is. We're, he's our boss, like it's his church. So we just, it's great to be able to just come together and, and worship together our one king, amen? amen. And so we, we, we actually, in, in that, in that um, we're just preaching in that direction. We started in, on Easter, we started this little series that's just gonna kind of invade our space every once in a while, this one series. And, and, and we started talking about how the church comes together uh, as one. And, and we're going to study all the times in Scripture where God's Word talks about one, like the number one, but O-N-E, like one Lord, one faith, one glorious hope for the future. We talked a little bit about that last week, you know, those types of ones. And we're going to jump back into that again this week. And probably just be this week, and then we'll go back and we'll study through more in the Gospel of Luke. But this week, we're just going to jump back into this series. But here's the thing. I, 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 I kind of left off some stuff last week, and I, I want to go back, and I just want to revisit some things, because I think there's some deeper learning there. I think there's some deeper understanding. Last week, I could tell. Like, I'm sitting up here, and I can see your faces, and I can tell when you're receiving a message, and it's easy, and I can tell when you're, when you're not receiving the message because it's hard. And so when I get up here and I start talking to a New Testament church where Jesus Christ is your pastor, and the world is talking about grace, 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 and love, and grace, and, and the freedom that's found in Christ, which is all true, Amen. But, but we get carried away there. And so when the preacher gets up and he starts talking about things that are required of you, it's like, whoa, what, this ain't like Old Testament wrath God. This is, this is New Testament, happy, friendly, loving God. Different God, different testament. I don't, and you could see it in people's faces though, right? Because they're like, ah, arms start crossing and, and they st you start seeing them do, and, the, and they're looking over and they start whispering to their friend like, 
You're like, is he right? Like, so I, I can see that there's some tension there. I want to I wanna expand a little bit on it because nobody likes to be told what to do. And so when I get up here and I start talking about requirements, there's some tension. We all get to, uh, like we said last week, we all want to pick our favorite Jesus, right? And we, talk, we played that little clip from, from, Rick, from Talladega Nights, you know, Ricky Bobby, his favorite Jesus is the, is the baby Jesus, right? And who's favorite, who's, who's favorite Jesus is baby Jesus? Anybody? The Christmas Jesus? No one? Why y'all spend so much stinking money then if you don't like him? <laughs> Liars. Liars. So, 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 but he likes the baby Jesus, but I, you know, I, I, I don't, that's not my favorite Jesus. Y'all know my favorite Jesus now. My favorite Jesus comes in on a white horse. And my favorite Jesus has eyes like fire with a sword coming out of his mouth. And his robe is dipped in blood. And he's got a tattoo. Lord of Lords, King of Kings. That's my favorite Jesus. There's all different kinds of Jesus, right? But no matter how Jesus appears, like visually, right? Because he was, before he came in the flesh, he was, he was, right? Before he came in the flesh, as baby Jesus, you know, six pound, eight ounce, golden fleece, you know, cute little baby Ricky Bobby Jesus. Before that, he already was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So he already was. So he was like a spirit. He hadn't put on skin yet, but then he puts on skin. He comes as a baby, and then he became an adolescent, and then he became an adult, and then he dies on the cross and goes to heaven and all that stuff. So there's all different types of visual, different Jesuses. Jesai? Jesus? Jesuses? Okay. Well, I thought, you know, Magi, Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. But no matter what Jesus you like, no matter what Jesus you pick, Jesus actually is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Amen. He's the same Jesus. He's always filled with the Spirit. And he's, listen, this is my passion now. He's always on mission. He, did you ever find anything in the Bible where it says, and he was just kind of doing, he was fishing with his buddies, and oh, wait, there's a person over here. Let's go heal him. It was always intention, always on purpose, everything he did. He only lived 33 years, so he had little time to waste. He was always working. He was always intentional about every single thing he did. That's the Jesus that I know. And so we saw Jesus last week, who's about 30 years old or so, and he goes to Sychar in Samaria, where he goes up on the mountain, the, 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 the path least traveled, right? Not the path by the Jordan River, which is plush and flat and comfortable, where he could go to... Uh, Galilee. No, he chose to go up the mountain. Why? Because he wanted to meet that lady at the well. Because he had a whole city there of people that didn't believe and didn't know him. And so he was going for a harvest. He had, he had, a, he had some buckets to fill, didn't he? And so he went to the well so he could fill those people with eternal water. He went there and it says that he had to go to Samaria. And no, he didn't. He didn't have to go geographically. He didn't have to go culturally for sure because they didn't talk to Samaritans, did they? But it says in the text, he had to go. Why? Because his father had put him on mission and he had no choice. He had to go. And you know, it's amazing. Like I said, no matter what Jesus you pick, the Jesus of the Bible never changes. So even though as a 30-year-old, he had to go because he was on mission because his father had put him on that mission. And just, just let me give you a little side note before we get into this. Father, just as you have sent me, so I send them. Just remember that little tidbit, okay? At 30 years old, he has to go up the mountain to Sychar. He had to. Do you know the same thing happened when he was 12? Same Jesus. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, as a kid, his parent, well, you know, his mom and then his dad, you know, Joseph, right? So, so they, they went from where they lived to, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, right? Okay, do you, you understand that if you're in Nazareth and you need to go to Jerusalem, it's, um, I don't know how many miles it is, but it's not from here to Lowe's. It's far. It would take a couple of days. And, and guess what? Um, here's, here's another one too, right? Um, 
They were days away from, from, from Jerusalem. But, 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 they, but, but worshiping God was important to them. And so they were willing to walk. Maybe, maybe, maybe they'd get lucky and have a donkey or a camel or something, but they would walk for days to go worship God. And listen, I'm preaching at you now. Some of us won't get in our car, have air conditioning, heated seats, SUV with backup camera and GPS to go two miles to go worship God. But they will walk for days. That's just a, that's a little extra. Okay, they'll walk for days. And so they go, and they, they go to worship the Lord on Passover. And so they get done with all that, right? They go to the temple. They worship God. That's great. They get done, and they must have come with some people. You read the text. You'll see they weren't alone, his parents. And so they've got Jesus with them, and there's some other people traveling from their town back over to Jerusalem to worship. And they get done, and they leave. It's time to go home. And when they go, it says that they traveled one day. And when nightfall came, they realized that they were the worst, per the worst parents that ever lived. They left God in Jerusalem. So there's hope if you think you're not a good parent. You're not that bad. You didn't leave God there. Okay. So, so they leave God. Here, here's the amazing thing. One day they traveled. Nightfall comes, they realize Jesus isn't there, so they turn around, they realize, we're horrible parents, let's go get our kid. So they go back to Jerusalem, listen, three days, after three days they finally found him. Now that's remarkable to me. And not so much that they were bad parents, but what was remarkable to me is that they went to Jerusalem to worship God, and they knew they got to go to church. They went to temple, church, same thing at the time, right, that's their church, they went to worship him. But yet, after being gone for less than a day, less than one day, how quickly we forget. It took three days for these knuckleheads to realize he's in church. It's just the way we are, right? We don't even think, they didn't think about that. Like, Jerusalem has a lot of people in it, but it's not New York City, man. It's not like millions and millions and millions of people there back then. It's not, it's not as huge as, as, as New York or Chicago. So if you went to Chicago and lost someone, it might take you three days. But we're talking about ancient Jerusalem. It's not that big. And it took them three days to think about church. They just come from there. They understand that he was just there with them. But they looked here and they looked there and they looked there and here. But they never even thought about going to church. That blows my brains. When they finally step back into the, into the house of worship, and there's Jesus, and he's hanging out. And of course, I, you know, I wasn't there, but I just imagine, you know, dad's probably blaming mom, right? And, and mom's blaming dad, and, but, but dad's like, doesn't want to give in, and it's her fault, but he, she doesn't care because she's a mom, so she probably runs over and embraces and hugs him. <clears throat> and he looks at them, and he says, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know? Like, why would it take you three days? Why wouldn't you think of this first? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house conducting my father's business? Because I, 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 that which I am required, I will do. And that's what he was, he came to seek and save. He came to do his father's business. He is on mission, straight out of heaven, straight to earth, on his father's mission. And so, yeah, it makes no sense. Why, why would you not look in the church? When you see this commitment to the trust that God the Father had placed upon his son, it starts to make sense when you hear uh, the Apostle Paul say things like, hey, give your entire body to Christ. Give your entire body to God as a reasonable act of worship. Give everything that you are. Well, because Christ followers follow Christ, and you see Jesus, whether he's a baby, whether he's 12, or whether he's 30, he gave himself wholeheartedly to his Father's mission. This is why I'm here, and I will accomplish that which is required of me. And Christ followers, finish it for me. Follow Christ, follow Christ. everybody. Christ followers. Follow Christ. All right, amen. Do as you're saying. Let's take a glimpse for a moment before we get into this one thing. Let's take a glimpse into the heart of Jesus Christ. This is an amazing opportunity here. Is everything okay? Are you sure? Are we missing a child or something crazy like we are? 
Who's running around? Do we need to find him? Oh, my God. <laughs> I got <gotcha. laughs> you. Oh, he said me. Was that him? Love you. <clears throat> so I want to take a glimpse into the heart of Jesus Christ for a moment. This is a rare opportunity. I want to take it. This is awesome. How does Jesus feel about the requirement of a trust that God the Father has placed on his life? Look for a moment at Luke chapter 12. I just want you to see now, this, this, we use a, a, a New Living Translation here at the church because it's super easy to understand, and I get that, but it's not real good here. But let, just look what it says here in Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 50. So as you're going there, in 49, he's like, I came to set the world on fire. I hope that he's doing that in you. He didn't mean he's going to like burn trees, okay? He meant you, the world, people, right? Let's get fired up about Jesus a little bit. Uh -um. So verse 50, look what he says. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me. And I'm under a heavy burden until it's accomplished. So you understand what, what, what Jesus is talking about. Like he understands the mission that God has him on. He understands that he's going to have to go through a lot of suffering and that the ultimate suffering will be on the cross, right? We get that. You see that coming? He says, I have this on the horizon. It's coming and it's a heavy burden. But I read this and something checked into my spirit and I said, you know what? I need to look somewhere because I don't think this does what Jesus is saying. I don't think it does him justice. I don't think that's what he's really trying to say. And so I jumped into a King James and I looked up the word and I see it's not that he's under a heavy burden. No, no, no. He says, I have a baptism of suffering and I am pained until I accomplish it. I am pained before I accomplish it. Think about this for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12 says that he endured the cross disregarding its shame. So, so, so all the, the humiliation where they strip him down naked in front of everybody, they spit on him, they slap him, they, 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 tore, they take a whip to his body and rip his flesh off and he's put up onto the cross. I mean, think of the pain and the agony and the humiliation of the cross. And what does it say? He disregards that. He's like, yeah, the bodily suffering and the physical abuse and the humiliation, no big deal. But not completing the task that's been entrusted to me by my father, that pains me. And see, we're, we're, we, I'm, I, would, I would venture to say, if I was to take a silent uh, vote here tonight, bless you, that, that, that we, would, we would consider what he went through on the cross to be just excruciating and brutal and the worst of worst, like, because we're humans, and, and so what we, our physical beings and our desire to, to please ourselves and be comfortable and, and avoid pain and any type of suffering, we, we do that. We work for that. But Jesus said, that stuff that you guys think is so important, now this is speaking to your priorities now, yo, okay? What you think is so much important, so important, nothing. Not doing what God the Father says, that pains me. And Christ's followers follow Christ. It should pain you to not do that which the Father requires of you. That should be the pain, not the pain of physical suffering. The pain of physical suffering, he said, no big deal. Not doing what God said crushes me. And you should feel that pain when you disregard what he says. So when the clouds open... And cage fighter Jesus comes ripping through the clouds. Whose kingdom is he going to see you building? His or yours? That's the question. So if you're a Christ follower, hear his voice now. He has entrusted you with his spirit, and he has entrusted you with his gospel mission. Listen, you are his plan. Much is required of you. If you're a Christ follower, listen up. You are required, it is not optional, you are required to go build the kingdom of God. There's no option in that. Someone please say amen or clap or something. <clears throat> you're required to build this church. You personally are required. The Christian faith is extremely personal. It's between you and the Lord Jesus. And I understand that. 
I have my relationship with God, and you have your relationship with God, and it's very, very personal. And there's diversity of gifts and styles, and some, some parts of the, you know, you open up the Bible and you read some things, and, and it just like fires you up like crazy, right? It resonates big time. And then there's some parts that you open it up, and, and this person's on fire when he's reading. He's going, man, can you believe this? And you're like, you, if you had a heart monitor on you, it wouldn't even beep. Right? That's just the way it is, right? How many people read in the morning? How many people read at night? A little different, right? NLT, KJV, NKJV. Some of us read the non-inspired version. Just kidding. Love you all. Yeah. <laughs> what NIV stands for. Just kidding. How many people in here Sabbath? I'm, try, I'm gonna hold my hand up high, halfway, right? T-Rex arms, I Sabbath. I'm trying, right? <clears throat> right? But, but sometimes you do it, like it's kind of kind of be tough for me to Sabbath on when I'm here working, <laughs> right? So I try to do it on one day and you do it on another day and some people come on Saturday night to worship and some people come on Sunday morning to worship. Some people sit up front, not enough of you by the way, just saying. <clears throat> some of you sit out, all of you sit out back. <clears throat> some celebrate Christmas. Some think Santa is Satan. I found out this week, I was just sitting there, I realized if you move one letter, Santa turns into Satan. Did you know that? I didn't know that. What have you guys been holding out on me for? You think I'm Jewish? I don't celebrate ho, ho, ho in Christmas, right? Yeah, buy me something this year. Make up for your slacking. So there's lots of different things in, in, in our faith, and it's personal, right? And, and Colossians 2.16 tells us, uh, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink uh, or uh, whether you celebrate certain holy days and new moon celebrations and Sabbaths. Like, don't, don't let anyone condemn you if, you if they're celebrating this thing. They open the book and they go, you know, I think that God wants us to do this. Awesome, do it. But if this person over here opens it up and goes, you know, I read that and I don't see that, don't condemn them. It's personal, right? It, you may be right. Awesome. Just shut up about it, right? Nobody needs you knocking on their door telling them what's wrong, right? That's not what we need to be doing. Um, but listen, the individual who is saved personally gets placed into the body corporately. So, so we, we, I, I beat this drum all the time, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, that God places the body together personally. Like, that's what he does. It's his job, and it's perfect, it says. His job, and he does it just right. So, like, if you're sitting here, awesome, you're part of his plan. It worked out real well, right? But here's the thing, it says, he places the, the body together perfectly, and as each person does their own special work, there's personal, there's the diversity, personal diversity right there. Each person in the body of Christ does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. Do you love the people sitting next to you? Yeah. Get busy then. So, so as, as that's personal diversity right there, right? It says that he places us together perfectly and as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow and the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. Personal diversity, corporate unity. That's what happens. He saves you, it's a personal relationship, but he puts you in the body and you function well there together and then the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. Amen? And that's what we're looking for. That's all, listen, every week, no matter what church you're in, the preacher gets up, and that's all he's looking for right there. If you would just do that, hallelujah, that's all. He, he, he's just getting up here, and he's saying, listen, God says that he placed you here, he gave you a gift. If you get to work, our church would be awesome. Quit no-showing. 
That's all it is. It's so, like we make a big deal out of it. Preacher, come up with something new and creative to get them to come. No, let's just straight up brass tacks. If you are here and you are saved, you have a gift, get to work. That's it. Amen. Drop the mic. That's all you have to do. And, and the church, no matter what church it is, the church will be, I'm going to yell, awesome if you would do that. That's it. That's all it takes. Just show up, roll up your sleeves, whatever it is. It might not be, when I say roll up your sleeves, you think about working, right? It may just be roll up your sleeves, roll up your, knee, your, your pants and get down on your knees and pray. Maybe you're a prayer. Maybe you just get in the other room and you just pour your heart out and say, God, please bless this church. They're gathering tonight. Speak to them. Let them hear you. I don't know what you have supposed to do. But whatever it is he's gifted you to do, just do it. And if we would all do that, the church would be absolutely amazing. And he speaks of this. So let's expand on this just a little bit. Jump into this whole idea of one, oneness, right? So let's look at Acts chapter 4. Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 4. I'm just going to read this. I, I'm going I'm to read Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 probably till my pages fall out. <clears throat> it's just... Man, I love the Bible, and, but this is just so incredible because this is not, I love Acts 2 and 4 because it's not that high and holy stuff that's really this ethereal, like, you know, like um, Red Sea opening, uh, you know, in the lion's den, but you don't even get killed, and in the furnace, but you don't even come out smelling like smoke, like all that crazy stuff. Man, if he would do it, that would be incredible. But this is like brass tacks. This is like everyday Joes, like you and me, getting together, doing the church thing. Jesus shows up. It's absolutely amazing. So like we could do this. And so this is why it fires me up. So, so, so what's happening here is, is Jesus has gone to the cross he, and, and he goes to the tomb and he, and he raises up from the dead and he goes up to, 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 to heaven, right? He's going to heaven. And so he's preparing a place. So he's busy. He's got his sleeves rolled up right now. He's working. He's praying for you right now. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. He's preparing a place. He's up. He's got his paintbrush going and he's rolling it and all that kind of stuff. And he's getting this place ready for you. And so while he's doing that, he's got this church down here, us, and, and, and so all these people are like totally freaked out because Jesus is Lord, and they saw him die, and then all of a sudden he walks through a wall and says, hey, I'm not dead, and they freak out. They're like, oh, we got to do this thing, right? Everyone needs to know about this Jesus, and so they start this whole thing called the church, and so it says here, all the believers, ver uh, chapter 4, verse, I can't even read, 32, all the believers, someone say all. Okay, I, was, I don't think all of you said it, though. Did all of you say it? Patrick didn't say it. All the believers. All. Well, you didn't say it again. We're going to do this all night. All. Really? Michael, say all. He left. Michael. All the believers were united in heart and mind. There's a lot there, man. I want God to build in you tonight something fierce. He's ferociously trying to come after you and get your attention. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Right? So all the believers were there. All the believers are united in heart and mind. And what happens when that happens? All of them were blessed. Nobody was left out. How many people are all? Everybody. Everybody. All. There was nobody missing, right? All the believers were there. All were united. And all were blessed. I want, I want that. Open up the windows of heaven, please, Father, on all these people. There were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them, bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. And it goes on with some specifics about this one dude that did something great. But just think about that. All the people, wow, that was awesome right there. That one actually sounds, when you really get a hiccup, you know, like it hurts your sternum. That's what that one sounded. That did not hurt? Did it? I'm sorry, dude. They were, they were united in heart 
and in mind. Think about that for a second. The heart, right? This is where we understand that, that emotions and feelings, that's where they come from, right? And, and, and our compassion flows from our heart and love flows from the heart and, and our desires for our life, they're in our heart. God places them there. That's the center of our being. That's where all that stuff exists and flows out of, right? And, and so what he's saying here is I'm gonna, all of them are gonna love like that. They're all gonna feel the way I do. They're gonna, they're gonna love the way I do. They're gonna forgive the way I do. They're gonna have compassion for others the way I do. And all of you will be the same. So this individual, this diversities of style, but we're all gonna have the same heart. We're all gonna feel the same way about him and about them. We're all gonna feel the same way. And it also says we're gonna have the same mind. We're gonna be united in mind, right? 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, but we understand the things of the spirit for we have the mind of Christ. So not only do we feel the same way that Jesus did, the same feelings that he has for people that put him on the cross on purpose, we would have those same feelings. And we understand the things that Jesus is thinking because we've been given the mind of Christ. I just want to take a second here and just like switch gears for just a second because I think this will really help everybody. There's a lot of Christians that go out and, and, and just beat people up with what they believe, with their theology. And you may be right. Listen, because you, you got a buddy who's just so awful. Like you can't believe they act this way. And you never stop to think that you used to do the exact same thing, right? But, 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 they're, but I'm saved now, and, and you should be, you know, going to church and praying and quit your cussing and all this kind of stuff. Listen, listen, listen. You understand that. Because when you got saved, he gave you his mind. You understand this. But the person who's not regenerated, he's not saved, he doesn't know. So don't beat the dude up and slash him down on Facebook. Just go love the guy. Amen. That's all. Let him cuss at you. Take the nail, man. Jesus did. Take the nail. Sometimes it comes in the form of a cuss word. Some, sometimes it comes in, a, in, in what, I don't even want to revisit it because I don't need to go there because that's bad for me. And you guys know me. I don't need that. I don't even want to be thinking about it. But I'm just saying take the nail, okay? Take the nail. <clears throat> so, We'd be united in heart and we'd be united in mind. We'd feel as Jesus feels. We would understand and we would rightly view God the Father and God's mission and we would rightly view the people that we're supposed to go get. We would understand just as Jesus did. What's Jesus feeling? How's Jesus loving? Who is Jesus forgiving? What are the desires of Jesus' heart? It's one of those opportunities that presents itself in scripture sometimes when the verbiage just locks perfectly, right? So what are the desires of Jesus' heart? What does Jesus want? First Timothy 2.4. It's God's desire that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his desire. That's the desire in Jesus Christ's heart right now. He wants everyone saved. And so for all those people you think are beyond the reach of God, they're so terrible, and they, they need to be nuked and bombed and killed and wiped out. Listen, that is not Jesus Christ's desire. Jesus Christ's desire is that you'd be a missionary and go get that hide saved. That's what he wants. Got silent here, didn't it? Real quiet. Because we naturally have enemies that we don't love, and Jesus says, pray for them. How's that feel? How you doing with that? I don't do so good with it. I'm glad you do. I'm not that good at it. But I need to learn and grow in that. <clears throat> His desire is that all people are saved. Seven billion right now. He wants every single person with hands held high to heaven saying Jesus is Lord. He would love it right now if every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Right now he would. That would be awesome. I don't know about you, but I'm all for that. <clears throat> That's what he wants. United in mind, united in heart. He wants everybody saved. He wants us to think like him. You know, and it's not just in the, in the New Testament. You know, way, 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 way. How far back? 
Way back. In Ezekiel eleven nineteen, it says this. Listen, I will give them one heart. Listen, some translations say, I will give them singleness of heart. That's awesome, right? Everyone who has Jesus Christ as Lord will have the same feelings, the same love, the same compassion, the same emotions that Jesus Christ has right now. That's what he wants. He'll give them singleness of heart and a new spirit. That, I'm going to preach. So he wants you to have a, a new feeling and a new emotion, a new compassion, and he wants to give you the power, the spirit, to go accomplish that. That's awesome. That's what Jesus Christ wants to do in all of us right now. He didn't just go tell you what to do. He gave you the power to do it. And it's in you right now. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And you can love like he does. You can have compassion like him. You can. It's your choice. All of his people, awesome. Think All of his people feeling the same, thinking the same. In Philippians 2, 2, not just one mind and one heart, but one, one purpose. One purpose. So I got this brewing up in my heart. I'm understanding the way God thinks about us and thinks about people and thinks about me. And because of all that, we have one task. One purpose. Is that, that's what the Bible says. We have one purpose. What does Jesus feel? John 3, 16. Right? He loves everyone. We all know that one. You could be an atheist, you know that one. Every clown at a ball game has it on his shirt. He, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's how he feels. What's Jesus thinking about? What's the purpose that he came? To build his church by saving people. It's, that's the revolution that he came to start. To, to build his church, that's really why he came, to build his church. Now, because of that, you are very, very fortunate. Because in order for him to build his church, he has to save you. Right? He can't build a building with no bricks. You're the bricks. He has to save you. So we, go, we all benefit. Everyone has a party. His kingdom grows and you get saved. It's a great deal. It's a great deal. That's what he's doing right now. So we're saved, but then we're placed together. Individually gifted, corporately united. So let's look at this corporate thing a little bit. And, and, and it's a good time to do it because, um, you know, in this church right here, um, God's building this church. You know, he's, he's just building this church. You know, it started with nothing. He's building his church. He's, he's building it uh, material-wise. He's building it people-wise. I was talking to you earlier. I said, I was walking through and showing him the church. I said, this is what free looks like. Amen. Right? Come on. It's not, it's, this, this, you can clap. God's good. Come on. <laughs> There's a lot of churches that are like nicer. <laughs> Ain't nicer than free, yo. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't care how nice your church is. No debt. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so we're, we're, let's look at this. He, he's, in, in, in this season right now, in 2017, God's building his church here at Revolution in particular, and that's where we are. So let's talk about this coming together, this gathering of all the believers. The scriptures say, do not neglect the meeting together. Let that speak to you every single week. I'm not going to hide it anymore, right? Every week, do not neglect Meeting together, okay? Did I make my point? <laughs> Do I need to say it again? Probably because I guarantee half of you won't be here next week. <laughs> That's just the way it works, right? You people, I love you. I guess if it all came together, I'd be out of a job, so it's all good, right? So, so... <laughs> Do not neglect the meeting together. So, so I want to take a look at two, this is what I want to do. I want to take a look at two amazing stories in Scripture where there was one mind, 
one heart and one purpose, one people in one place. Okay? So you look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, it's the whole, the whole, the whole chapter is incredible. But the, the, it's divided into like two different sections. So the, the beginning of it is this thing, you may have heard of it, called Pentecost. Right? So, so what happens is all the believers gather together. So just look here in Acts chapter 2. It says, just look what it says. On the day of Pentecost, all, how many? All. Okay, all. So let's just talk, let's just glean from this our context. Because I can't, I can't talk about the people that are in Apopka right now. Right? I, can't, I can't speak of the people that are in Ocala right now, all right? but I can speak to you because you're here. So, and, and, and listen, I love the Father's house, I love you, and, and this is for you too, but you understand that it's not quite because you've you got a church. It's right down the road, it's awesome, great church, but let's just talk about the people that are in your church and then the people that are in this church, one church, right? Amen? Please? Okay. Right. But, 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 but let's just talk about you because you go here. This is the place that God, remember, says that he placed us together perfectly. So it wasn't your choice. You were, just, you were brought here. His spirit drew you in like a tractor beam in a sci-fi movie. Here you are. You're in church. And so it says here that on the day of Pentecost, all the believers, all, were meeting together in one place. Right? Now look what happens. Just in case you've never heard, you, this may be your first time in church, I don't even know. And if it is, I'm so glad you're, you're here. So they're all together in one place, all of them, one joint. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. I'm going to just read the whole thing. At that time, there were de devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And Now, now listen, that's, that's awesome right there. I just, that, I, just, I just picked up on that one. When, when God comes down on his people, right? So we're in the room, and God's spirit comes in a manifest way, like powerful. It's like, wow. But what happens? He because we're in here doing our thing, like, whoa, we don't realize that God's using the whoa in here to draw people out there in here, right? So that was, that was good. That's good. Just saw that one. So, so you never know what's going on in here. Like, don't think. Look, maybe today's modern day context is Facebook Live. Maybe someone's watching it right now. What's going on in here, they're seeing it out there. Maybe he's using that to draw people to him and to his body. Could it be? Could it be? Could it be? I think it could be. So, so it says that they, um, when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Like, that's freaky, right? Unbelievable. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they explained. These people are, are, are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, and he lists a bunch of them. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other, but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. All the people gathered in one place. One mind, one spirit, one place, one people. And God showed up in an insane way, right? But the story doesn't end. Like, like the, the tongues of fire and the speaking in tongues, like I get, that's incredible, and if it happened right now, it would freak me out. I'd be so thrilled. It'd be awesome. I believe that it could, although I think this is an isolated thing that was special at the time, and it's probably not going to ever happen again, but you guys can fight about that. The Baptists are going to duke it out with the Pentecostals right now. It's all good. Take it out in the lobby. I'm not going to get in that fight. But, yeah. but, but, now, but now look at, look at this here. Whether you, whatever side of the fence you fall on the speaking in tongues and all that stuff. You know, I make light of the Baptist and the Pentecost, but that does, I'm just joking around, but whatever side of the fence you may fall there, we all fall on the same side of the fence in the next paragraph. Because what happens is, 
in that moment. It's still going on, right? They didn't leave anywhere. It just says, right, then. Then. Right then. Peter steps forward with the 11 other apostles and shouts to the crowd, and he starts preaching. He starts preaching, and it's, it's a whole long sermon right here, but look at verse 41. One heart, one mind, one purpose, one people, in one place, God shows up, and what happens? Verse 41, those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, 3,000 people. That's insane awesomeness. And I know you all want to see that. I'm not the only one. You all want to see that. There's, a, there's something inside of you. You show up for church every single week, and you know it's going to be good, and you're going to have a good time, and maybe you'll get a little nugget. But back in the back, back, back part of your mind, you're th- there's this little thing, and you might not admit it because you, you grew up Catholic or you grew up Southern Baptist. Well, they don't kind of talk about that, but there's this little thing inside you that says, man, I wish God would show up like that, and I know that he could. And he probably won't, though, but that's what we do, Right? But there's that thing, and you know you want it so bad. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? So why wouldn't he do it? Well, we already heard a moment ago that it's God's desire that 7 billion people get saved. 3,000 would be a little pebble in the, in the pond. But he wants that. We, we, it's God's desire that all are saved. So would he not do this? Is he refusing? Is is he up in heaven with his arms crossed going, no, I don't want to do this. I have a different plan. No, we already heard that it is his desire that all are saved. So he wants to do this. Do you agree? Will he? Could. I, I don't know. But we saw that it happened. And we know the desire of God's heart. So it's a possibility for sure. Pentecost, Holy Spirit falls, fills the people, gifted like crazy. People from outside are running in to see this, what's going on with this God that they're now starting to hear about. You know, they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't know. And like, whoa, what's going on? I hear the rumble, I, I feel the wind, and I, what's going on up there? I gotta know, I gotta know. Listen, church can be that way. Church can be that way. Look, you are created in his image. There's nothing in all of creation that's as awesome as you. And when God shows up and he starts ministering in and through his people, that's the greatest thing on earth. And so when that starts happening, you don't think God would draw people here? Come on, man. Yeah, someone's got to get fired up. He said, I came to fire you up. Why aren't you fired up? Three thousand people get saved and added to the church. Man, that'd be awesome right now. We'd have to start building again. Yes. Yeah. Has Kyle landed yet? We might have to call him back. So, <laughs> someone said, "Man, this church is growing. You're gonna have to get a new building sometime soon." I had mixed emotions. You know what I mean? I was like, "Really? Like that? That's good. Yeah." If we can get 3,000 people here, we could pay a contractor. Amen? Yes! I wouldn't get shot anymore. It'd be the best. Ah, preacher's dreams. Oh, it's dream big, right? I just don't want to get shot. So, Holy Spirit drops. Huge attraction to the, to the, to the working of God in the people. All in one place. One people in one place. There's something there. I don't know, right? But so, so let's look on here. So, so 3,000 people get added, right? So it says at Pentecost they were in a house. Well, that's going to have to be a really big house if there was 3,000 people. So obviously it's not happening in the house anymore. But yet the scriptures don't change. The scriptures don't say, well... There were, there were 120 of them here, and then 3,000 people got saved, so they started creating some denominations, and they started this church over there, and they started that church over there, and right, that's not what it says, does it? Because it goes on and it says, 
that stubborn word once again. All. All the believers not just devoted themselves to the teaching and the fellowship and sharing meals and communion and prayer. Miracles are happening, but look at verse 44. And all the believers, 3,000 of them, met together in one place. See, something's going on here. I don't think that God's at a loss of words. I don't think he's confused. I don't think he's like, hey, this is going to be the book that sets everyone's imagination on fire. Everyone loves the book of Acts. Let's just put in some really good stuff. That's not what it is. It's, 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 it's just the same as Leviticus. It's just God's word. It's just the truth. It's just the way we're supposed to view him. It's just the way we're supposed to view us. It's just the way we're supposed to view the church. It's just the way we're supposed to live our lives. It's nothing different. It's a little spooky because you don't understand because people freaked you out and did stupid stuff. Pick up the Bible, read it, ask questions to people you know, love, and trust, and acts won't be scary anymore. So all the believers met in one place together. Now, we beat this thing to death, but it's, it's highlight. Uh, mine's, listen, I'm not, I'm not like bragging, but my Acts 242, I don't know about your Acts 242 through 47, but my Acts 242, 47 is highlighted and circled. That means it's super wicked important, right? It's important because when, when we start a church, we don't have to try to make up anything. That's it. Right there, right? So, so remember, it says that he gave you a new heart to feel certain ways and a new mind to think certain ways and then a new spirit so you have the power to do it, but he also gives you the plant so you know what to shoot for. I don't know about you, but I've mentioned this before. Guys, are you with me? We need a target on the wall. We have no idea where we're going. I can't speak of the ladies, but I know for men, I've got to have a target or I am just all over the place, right? I'll never get there. I need something. And so God provides it. He's like, listen, guys, I gave you the thoughts. I gave you my heart. I gave you the purpose. I gave you the mission. I gave you my spirit, and I gave you the plan. Here it is. When you gather, when you say, I want to be part of a church, this is what we're shooting for right here. This is what we're shooting for. Meeting together all the time. Do not neglect this coming together. Why? Because we need one another. It says in that same verse, to encourage one another. Did you guys know that when you're absent and your seat's empty, you're not encouraging the guy sitting next to you? Your empty seat does not encourage anybody. I'm just throwing it right, right out there. It doesn't. I've been down this road before. We were with you in spirit. No, you weren't. You were not. You were at the Gator game in spirit and in truth. You are not here, so I don't want to hear it. Just don't call me at all if you're going to call me with that one. I loathe that phone call. So I'm with you in spirit. Really, is just spirit going to pay for our electric bill? Okay, I'm done. All right, so I'm uh, just saying, right? I mean, really? Come on, let's be real, right? We're all real, right? Um, so it says that they shared everything that they had, sold their property, shared the money, met together, Great joy and generosity, and join the goodwill of, there it is again, of all the people. And so here they are. They, all the believers meet together in one place. And what happens? Each day, the Lord added to their fellowship, to their church, right there, those that were being saved. So I don't want to start screaming again, but when you come to church, isn't that what you really want? Don't you want to see that happen? Isn't that what you're thinking? Like, that maybe this would, like, I've been going to this church for, for five and six years, but maybe this is the week. This is the week that the place is going to be packed. And this is the week when everyone's going to come to the altar weeping and going, Lord Jesus, I need you. And the prison doors are going to open up down at the county, and they're all coming to church. We all want that to happen, right? It did. It did. And it's God's desire that all people are saved. Why wouldn't he do it again? All the people met in one place. 3,000 people got saved one day. And then each day after that, they kept getting saved. Why isn't anyone getting saved here tonight? I don't know. 
Maybe they will. Why isn't someone getting saved every single week that we're here? I don't know. Maybe, I'm just saying, maybe it's because all of you refuse to meet in one place. Could it be? I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know. What will God do if we all decide to meet in one place? What's going to happen if we all commit to gathering here every single weekend? Look, God is so good to you. What if he said you have to do this every single day like they used to? How many would do it? Maybe a handful. Let's just start with this right here. Let's just start with Saturday night at 6 o'clock. What would happen if all of us committed to showing up here every single Saturday night at 6 o'clock? What would God do if we all meet in one place and shared everything we had? Will his Holy Spirit show up in tangible, supernatural ways? If we all commit to meet here every weekend, would large numbers of people start getting saved? If we all commit to meet here in one place with one mind and one heart and one purpose of loving the Lord and loving people so much that it's our great desire to see those two come together so that people are saved and God is honored. Would God add to our fellowship every single week those that are being saved? I'm really not sure. I don't have the answer. But I do know this for sure. That when, according to God's word, which is true, <clears throat> that when God's people all chose to gather in one place, <laughs> right? Oh, he showed up. He showed up. I'm not talking about in your car while you're singing songs. I'm talking Pentecost, yo. I'm talking 3,000 people getting saved. I'm talking about Peter who was a coward stepping forward and risking his life and maybe going to the cross to preach that you crucified Jesus and if you don't bow your knee to him, you're gonna go to hell. Like crazy powerful stuff showing up. That's what happens when God's people would obey what God's word says. Amen. And when we do it, he will do these things. So we don't have to make up our own church. We don't have to make up what we think God wants. He's already told us what he wants. It's right here. If God's people would commit to having one heart, one mind, one purpose, and all meet in one place, I think God shows up Amen. and does crazy things, right? I do. <clears throat> and listen, I appreciate your clapping. I, and I know that it's not for me. It's because I think that there's a party that believes what you're reading here. I really do. Because I am not the best orator. So it's not my speech that makes you excited. It's because there's a party that says, you know what? I know it's far-fetched. Because we're just this church of maybe a total of 100 people. In this little town of Leesburg. What do you think those people thought when they were sitting in a room? Surrounded by a city that hated them and wanted them dead. What do you think they felt like? But when they chose to be obedient, when they chose to gather all of them in one place, God showed up. And when God shows up, everything changes, right? Everything changes. Amen? It's a difficult message, but I hope that you'll you're that soil that we spoke of earlier that would let it sink down in. And that it would, and, and listen, I'm, gonna, I'm, 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 I'm preaching for your pastor right now too. You guys are on the worship team, so you're probably there all the time, but maybe not. Maybe there's someone on the team that's not there all the time that needs to be committed to the purposes and the mission of God at the Father's house. And I'm speaking to all of you too, same here. If you'll commit 
to what God has done. He's entrusted you with his spirit and his mission and you are required corporately to gather in his name and sh- show up so he can do some awesome stuff. Amen? Amen. 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 Listen, we're gonna, we're gonna take a few moments. We're gonna take communion together, all right? I mean, th- what better time, right? What better time to take communion than this? When, when we're talking about all of us, one people, right? One person, one mind, one heart, one purpose, one mission, one Lord, one God, one glorious hope for the future, one people with the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask if you would, a couple of guys come forward and, and, and just pass this out and hold on to it. And, and then we're going to take it together as a family. But while you're holding on to it, I want you to do this. Not only do I want you to remember Jesus Christ on the cross, but I want you to remember something specific about this. That the scriptures say that, you can give it out, you can give it out, you can give it out, go ahead. So the, the scriptures say that on the cross, he broke down walls of hostility and built one family, right? One family. He brought us together. And, and so think about the way you're living your Christian life. Now let's just call it, just simplify it. How are you doing church? How are you doing the church thing? His bride, his church, his body, right? His missionaries, that's you. His priests. How are you doing with that? What, what about your level of commitment to his church and the church's mission? You, his plan, which is you. Whose kingdom are you building? Yours? Maybe you're building some company that you work for and they just ask everything of you and you give them everything of you and leave nothing for the Lord. I don't know whose kingdom you're building, but just take a few minutes and think of that and then we'll get back together. We'll take communion as a family and then we're going to worship Jesus.